How are we here already? Just two weeks left in the regular season. Um, I feel like the, for the love of God, cherish it meme right now. I mean, it's everything that we've worked for, everything we've waited for to get to the end, to get towards rivalry week. And yet here we are just two weeks away from the end of the regular season. So guys, I was thinking about it as we were working on the run sheet and my attitude for tonight is, you know what, let's just, let's party. Let's party. We've got some fun games to talk about. We've got Maction. We've got Conference USA in a pseudo playoff for these last two weeks. I mean, we're going to cherish it. We're going to cherish it. Uh, and with that, we welcome you in to the Three Technique College Football Podcast at the intersection of the X's and O's and the Jimmy's and the Joe's. Garrett Turney, Trey Reeves. I'm Mitch Mason. Glad to have you with us. Uh, guys, how are we feeling ahead of this week where it feels like so many fans are looking ahead to rivalry week, but... You mess up this week, and suddenly your season could very well be over. Yeah, there's a lot of look-ahead opportunities. There's a lot of tough road games, especially in the SEC. There's a lot of chances for people to be expecting their season to be decided next week, but it could ultimately get decided this week if they're not careful. So lots on the line this week. Almost every single game has stakes at some point. When you factor in tiebreakers, how – every little matchup could shift a three or four team tiebreaker in some conferences and decide who goes to the championship game. There's implications everywhere. And, and not just implications for your championship games, but also playoff seating and, you know, how you compare to other people. And, and a lot of that is because of this expanded playoff. I know people have been hating on the committee recently, but let's not, you know, throw the whole thing out. This 12 team playoff, in the first year and the first iteration is already making things way more interesting at the end of November. And I think that's exciting. I think it's good. And I think it's good for the sport. Uh, all the, you know, 12 team deniers, I think are, you know, a lot of egg on their face uh, these last couple of weeks as things have only gotten more exciting and more interesting down the stretch. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I agree. I, I think the, for the most part, the playoff committee got it right last night. I think there's a few things that you could quibble with, no doubt. I was listening right. to you guys on the live show, listen to our friends over at Always Talking Ball this morning. I think a lot of talking points to take out of it um, and, and some things certainly maybe to tweak and adjust in the offseason train. And we've thrown around the idea of building kind of the BCS model 2.0. Um, I, I think there's going to be an article that we're going to write about that to, to kind of flesh it out. But all of that can wait for the offseason. What we've got is three big games that are absolutely relevant to uh, not only the conference championship discussion, the playoff discussion, national storylines as well. And then we're going to go conference by conference and, and pick out the gems, I think, in, in week 13. But before we get there, uh, a, a landmark announcement from our friends over at homefieldapparel.com. They're the featured sponsor on this podcast. And guys, for the first week ever, I'm going to tell you not to use our code 3TechPod for 15% off. What I am going to tell you is to use code BFCM24 for their Black Friday deal, which is 30% off all site-wide. Anything on the site, 30% off. If you want to support the show still, you can shop through the link in our bio. Um, just go to our Linktree page. You'll, you'll find our link. If you use the code through our link, that also helps support the show. But seriously, go get your Christmas shopping done, guys. They're, I, I don't I don't know if I'm breaking any news here. Probably not because the podcast is going to come out the day they announce this. Baylor's going to have a new anthracite jacket that's up on the website. They've got hats. They've got bomber jackets. They've got hoodies, T-shirts, of course, that you know and love. So get your Christmas shopping done early. Get your Black Friday shopping done. BFCM24. We'll put it on our social media. Again, 30% off the entire website. I think it's their biggest biggest deal that they've done in the history of their website. So make sure you go support them and uh, get yourself some, some really sweet looking college apparel. Guys, with that, let's jump into our big three, shall we? And we start in Columbus where the number two Ohio State Buckeyes are hosting number five Indiana. 
This is a 13 and a half point spread in favor of the Buckeyes in 11 a.m. kick on Fox. Feels like this should be a night game with all the playoff implications, but uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys first. Trey, what do you feel like the biggest storyline coming out of this game is or going into this game, I should say? Unfortunately, it feels like the biggest storyline is Indiana's strength of schedule, and that really takes away from just living in the moment and enjoying a top five matchup in the Big Ten this late in the season. Indiana, I know there's a story about how they dropped Louisville in the non-conference and replaced them with Western Illinois or whatever. Other than that, they can only play the teams that are on the schedule, and they've beaten everybody on their schedule so far. So, yes, the strength of schedule is lacking, but they have a chance to fix that this week, and it's really taking away from the conversation on the field with what I think is going to be a good game. I'm going to take Indiana to cover the spread. 13 and a half points just seems like a lot for not only what we've seen out of Indiana and the way that they've played this year, but how Ohio State has typically played in these types of games. Guys, you have to go all the way back to 2021 to find the last time Ohio State beat a ranked team by two touchdowns. That was when uh, Kenneth Walker led Michigan State was all the way up at number seven, and they were humbled when they played the Buckeyes to the tune of a 56-7 to seven loss late in the year. I think they extended Mel Tucker right before that game too, so all kinds of errors coming out of that one. But I will say there is – I do think there's a path to a blowout win for Ohio State. That's not completely off the table for me. Michigan, maybe they had a blueprint on how to slow this offense down. They did hold Curtis Rourke under nine yards per attempt for the first time. No team had done that since FIU did it in week one, and I think those circumstances were completely different. So really interested to see how this Indiana passing attack especially matches up with the Ohio State secondary. I think that's going to decide how close this one ultimately is and if Indiana actually has a chance to pull off a shocker. That's a good point that you make about the Ohio State secondary. Guys, Denzel Burke came into this season as one of the top corners projected in, in this NFL draft, and he has gotten burned multiple times this year. Uh, it, it's been quite often that we've seen the big-time opponents pick on Burke. We saw Oregon do it to great effect. We saw Penn State try and do it a little bit as well. There have just been moments where you've gone, I don't know if that's the first-round cornerback that we thought we had Coming into this season, uh, Indiana is in the Big Ten championship game with a win over Oregon. They've got stakes that they're playing for like never before. We've obviously already hit the the 10 win mark for Indiana, a program first. Now can Indiana take that next step? Can they put all the noise about who they have or who they haven't played behind them and go into an enemy territory and knock off the Ohio State Buckeyes? Ohio State, furthermore, is down their starting center. Seth McLaughlin tore his Achilles, you know, reports that maybe it was done in practice, maybe it was done off the field, regardless, a terrible injury for Ohio State. Really, an offensive line that was already dealing with injuries now loses their captain up front as well. I'm throwing the metrics out in this game. You, you look at some of the numbers, and, and Ohio State has certainly been an impressive team. Indiana has been bludgeoning just about everybody that they've played, but I'm throwing the, the numbers out. And I'm going purely eye test here. And, and Trey, very similar to what you're saying, Ohio State has not showed me consistently the ability to take an opponent that is above average and just blow them out or, or put them away comfortably. And I think if Ohio State is going to do that, they're going to have to do it early in this game. They're going to have to jump on Indiana and, and get the crowd into it early. I trust Indiana to stay in this game. I trust their wide receiving core. I trust the running backs that are four deep. Um, and I think Indiana has played well defensively as well. I just think that this is a good enough team to stick around. And if they are going to lose, you get 13 points to lose by. So I'm going to take Indiana plus the points as well. I, I'm going to be the stick in the mud here. And, and I'm going to go ahead and say that I think Ohio state covers this and wins this game fairly comfortably. And, and I really went back and forth on this, and this is a tough one for me to decide on because, you know, you look at this, this is a real strength on strength. Indiana's got the second best scoring offense in the country. Ohio State has the best scoring defense in the country. So it's a real strength on strength thing. You're kind of like, okay, which one's going to break? You can break down the individual matchups. You can break down, you know, who in the secondary is a little vulnerable for Ohio State. You know, who do we think can have a big time, uh, you know, day for Indiana on the offensive side? But guys, for me, this comes down to this. I think 
first off, I want to go ahead and give Indiana their props. They've been playing exceptionally well, and they've been playing, I think, well above what the talent level on their roster indicates. I, I love what Signetti's doing. I love what he's been able to accomplish. But he's, I think, punching well above what his weight has been up to this point. He's he's definitely been going in there and taking out teams that have better rosters. They're just teams that have better talent because they've been able to establish that talent over the course of however many years it's been. So, again, still year one for Signetti. Really, the problem for me came a couple weeks ago when they play Michigan. And this is the first time that they were really, you know, against a team and playing up against a team where – they weren't automatically just, you know, even in skill talent or maybe the margin was kind of close. Michigan was kind of the better talented team and their offense struggled for the first time kind of all season. They, they put out 20 points. Their previous low was 31. For me, I think the disparity is even greater against Ohio State. I think the offense is going to struggle because at a certain point, though I don't think that Ryan Day at this stage, I don't necessarily trust him to coach a better game than Signetti. I just think at some point the talent has to win out. I think at some point the Jimmys and the Joes for Ohio State are just better. They're just better athletes, better players. And at a certain point, I think that's just going to win out. I think that, you know, as fun as it's been and as good of a season as it's been, and there should be absolutely no shame for Indiana, you're probably going to finish the season 11-1 and and end up hosting a playoff game. But despite all of that, I still think that Indiana probably loses this game by a fair margin. I think they're going to keep it respectable, but I think they probably lose something like 14 to 17 points here. I think Ohio State has some stuff to prove. I think Ohio State knows they need to get it together, and I think they're going to go out there and put out a great performance. So talk to me about the aftermath of this game. Let's say that Indiana loses this game, but they cover the number. They keep it respectable. They're, they give it a puncher's chance, and Kirk Signetti and the boys walk out of Columbus with their heads held high. 11 and one Indiana. Do they make the college football playoff as an at large team? Garrett, you're saying they host. I, I think they host. Yeah. Because right based, now, based on what? Well, so the committee's already shown that this team should be up there, right? They're <coughs> currently, sorry, currently ranked in a, in a hosting spot, right? They're currently ranked where they would be hosting. When you're looking at the teams further down that list, they kind of, and we talked about it a little bit on the live show, talking about the, the reactions, there's just kind of an SEC log jam, and not all of those teams are going to end up making the playoff. There's a lot of teams kind of log jammed in there towards the bottom of the playoff. Some of those teams are going to lose. Some of those teams are going to not make the SEC championship game, and they're going to get passed up by other teams. I think one of those teams that has a chance to make the case that they should be seated higher is Indiana. I think if your one loss is to a team like Ohio State, who could finish, I mean, as high as two or three, uh, assuming they don't beat Oregon, if they do beat Oregon in the Big Ten Championship game, they could finish as the number one team in the country. If that's where you're sitting as Indiana and your resume says, I'm 11-1 and one and my only loss is on the road to Ohio State, especially in the circumstances you gave, Mitch, where it's a close game, I, I don't see how they aren't hosting a game against a, you know, a two-loss SEC team or – you know, maybe even a Notre Dame who their loss is a lot more glaring of a problem They're, You know, Notre Dame doesn't really have the strength of schedule argument either. Uh, it, it's, you know, there's, there's some, there's some problems with everybody's resume this year. And I think if you're a one loss team who can boast a pretty good scoring margin, you can boast, you know, all of, all of the things that India has, India has been able to accomplish this year. If you could do that, I think you're hosting and I think you're in. I hope you're right, Garrett. I, I really do. I have my doubts that the committee is going to do that though. Uh, I think there's a chance that they get Florida stated, honestly, if they lose this one, if, if they cover, I think they're in decent shape. And I do think that they would be traveling if this is a close game, but if they lose this one and it's an Ohio state cover or an Ohio state win by about three touchdowns, there's a real chance that they get Florida stated, man. And I hate that, but that's just the world that we're living in right now. I, I will say, and I want to make this point, because I was thinking about this a little bit earlier, I think even with the loss, Indiana has a very similar case for the playoff as the Texas Longhorns, assuming no conference championship, right? If the Texas Longhorns don't win the conference, it's a similar case because the wins just haven't been there. The losses are quality, but the wins just haven't been there, right? I, you know, they were even flashed the graphic for Texas's best wins, and they said Vandy and Arkansas, and I was like, well, that's that's not exactly 
uh, murderer's row of wins there for the Longhorns. And I don't want to turn this into a bashing Texas segment, obviously, but right now, if you're just looking at both teams where they are right now, the wins just aren't there. If Texas is able to win out and win the conference, obviously it's a different case, but just where they stand right now, I don't really see the the massive difference. I know that maybe top to bottom, the quality of team isn't exactly the same in the Big Ten as it is in the SEC. I know that there's probably some Big Ten fans that are going to you know hate me for even saying that, but I, I I just think at the same time you have to say, well, who have you really beaten up to this point? I, you know, for Indiana, it's Michigan. For Texas, is it Vanderbilt? Is it Arkansas? I just think that the 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 argument is similar for both teams saying, hey, you've got a bunch of wins, but really who against? Well, in theory it is, but the the strength of record metrics favor the Longhorns by almost 70 places in that. And so I think right. that's where – Indiana is in danger of really getting getting left out. Now, the way I look at it, Garrett, I I do tend to agree with you that I I think there's I think they find their way into the field. If they lose this game, I would be shocked if they're hosting a playoff game. I, I think that that one chance at a statement win is going to be held against them for better or for worse. If they keep it close, I think they're in. If they get blown out, I, I think they're rooting for a little bit of chaos in rivalry weekend to to kick a couple of teams out. They're certainly rooting for the Big 12 champ to, um, you know, come from out of nowhere. Maybe it's Arizona State. We'll see. Uh, but this is going to be, I think a, I think a bookmark in the history of the playoff. Depending on what happens in this game, you're going to have folks either say the system works or the system doesn't work. You're going to have calls for reform anti-expansionist takes, what have you, depending on what happens in this game. So without a doubt, I think it's the biggest story going on in our sport this well, week. And one more thing on that, as a fan of an SEC team and as a person who thinks the SEC is the best conference in football, if a one-loss Indiana, whose only loss is to Ohio State, can't find their way in to the playoff, if they get left out at 13, as opposed to like 10-2 and two Tennessee, or something like that, uh, I will be all up in arms, pitchforks right there alongside all Hoosiers fans and all of the rest of college football, because that's ridiculous. Like at a certain mm -hmm. point, you have to reward winning. They've been blowing teams out all season. Their first close game they play all year is against Michigan. That's still a really solid defense. Like, uh, again, I don't think that they win this game against Ohio State. I'm not trying to make the case that they're just this awesome juggernaut, but they're a damn good team and they should be in the playoff instead of a non-SEC champion, 10-2, and two, somewhere in that mix type of team. Indiana has looked how you want teams to look against inferior competition, right? They're, they're taking it to them. Offensively, defense has played very well. They forced some turnovers. They've had big splash plays. They've really checked all the boxes. Where I'm hopeful that they get the nod is you look at what the conference schedule could have been and I think that takes a sting out of, in my mind, the resulting strength of record. I mean, honestly, it, it's going to go back to if you beat a team when they're ranked, but then they lose a bunch of games, Does that is, is that a ranked win? Is it not? When, when Are you we, talking about strength of record or strength of schedule? Well, I, I think I think both. Strength of schedule is where they're... Strength of schedule is where the big delta is yes. for Indiana. Strength of record, Indiana is actually sixth in the country. C so the correct. one that measures if the average top 25 team would have the same record as Indiana, they're actually sixth in the country. So that, that actually right, right behind yeah. Texas. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But strength of schedule. Um, yeah. I, I Again, the, the argument's the same. I, what I will say is this, like if they leave Indiana out and then they use the phrase I test at any point in time to justify somebody making the play uh, the playoff this year, I will be the first one grabbing my pitch for heading straight to grapevine. I, I won't stand for it, man. That's it is not a long walk for me. Uh, I, I will be there. And, uh, you know, this isn't obviously a threat or anything like that. Don't don't take it that serious. But I will be for legal purposes. Yeah. Yeah. For legal purposes. <laughs> this is obviously a joke. Uh, but yeah, that that would be absurd. I would be right there with all the Big Ten fans if they get left out. And then they use the eye test for like Texas, Tennessee, Alabama, somebody like that. Like if, you know, whoever pick your SEC team that doesn't end up winning at all. I, I would be absolutely pissed off with the rest of the Big Ten and the rest of the college football world about that.
The, the problem also, is side note to Big Ten fans: if we want to use the strength of record argument, that means five SEC teams get in. So, which play which, stupid games, win stupid prizes. I, I think <laughs> I think is a very real possibility. I outlined that in my in my last article. It just the way the math lines up. Um, I do think we're heading with the ACC and the Big Twelve essentially becoming one big bid leagues. I think we're headed towards five SEC teams. We'll see how many Big Ten teams get in. I, I would love for Indiana to get in for sure. Let's go to the Big 12, speaking of, and uh, a race for one spot, I think, is what this conference has turned into. We've got number 14, BYU, on the road at number 21, Arizona State. The Forks are favored by three here at home. And guys, I'm going to say Forks up. Let's let's ride with Arizona State. My reasoning for this is, is twofold. Number one, I'm going to run roll with the better running offense at home. The defense has shown that they can be plucky. They are undefeated at home, and Kenny Dillingham really has the boys juiced up. Uh, I love the way Arizona State is playing. Now that they're healthy, Levitt's back. The offense has, has certainly looked a lot more stable than that one-game jaunt with Jeff Sims at quarterback. But number two, I'm really concerned about BYU. I am really concerned the air might have come out of the balloon last week. I, I mentioned this in a, in a Twitter comment when someone – I've forgotten who was saying that you know BYU is taking all of this disrespect from from college game day, and nobody believes in the Cougars. And my takeaway was not that BYU is being disrespected, but that folks said the 2022 TCU model is not going to work again. Mathematically, we just can't have the ball bounce that way so many times in a row, and eventually it did catch up, catch up with BYU. Now, even though everything is still in front of the Cougars, they still control their destiny to a Big 12 championship and to a college football playoff spot. Does it not feel like that bubble of invincibility has been popped? Because I'm I'm wondering if now they go on the road where Arizona State has not lost at home this season, that feels like a much different test than if BYU had found a way to beat Kansas a week ago. My only pushback on that is, do we really trust Arizona State to be the team that can fully vanquish BYU season? I think they were in a weird spot against Kansas last week. And honestly, like the Big 12 is just such a blender that you throw all these teams in and you just press play and you figure out who comes out on top each week. And I, if you go back to our preseason prognostications, which mean next to nothing at this point, we all agreed that Kansas was a super talented team. We did. Some of us, some of us thought that Kansas might win ten or eleven games, but who knows? Um, I, I, are we really ready to say that Arizona State is that much better than Kansas that they can fully bury BYU? I don't know because neither BYU or Arizona State has exactly played a murderer's row schedule in the Big Twelve for whatever that it's worth. Whatever a Big Twelve in twenty twenty four murderer's row schedule is. Neither one of them have played it. They both avoided Colorado. They both avoided um, some of the other top teams, Iowa State to this point. And I, I think that I still believe a little bit more in BYU, as weird as that sounds. I think that Arizona State is coming in hot at the right time. I certainly think that both of these teams can get got on the ground. So whoever establishes that run game, and Cam Scadabo is certainly a fair person to bet on in that matchup. But we are talking about. Uh, just a botched pooch punt away from BYU probably escaping that Kansas game, right? I don't think Kansas was going to drive the field on Saturday and set up a game-winning touchdown. They needed that miracle pooch punt and just a really comical series of events to knock off BYU. Obviously, they got the win. Obviously, BYU has been close to losing other games this year, and it kind of evened out. But on the one game on the field on Saturday, I feel still feel like I'm a little bit more confident in BYU to at least cover the three-point spread. So I'm going to take them in the points. Wouldn't surprise me at all if Arizona State wins this game, obviously, but I'm going to take BYU in the points. Yeah, I'm with you, Trey. I think BYU wins this game. I think BYU covers this three. I I, I just think that they're too good of a team, but they made their mistakes last week, right? Like the, the mistakes happened. They beat themselves. There were things that were very much within their control, uh, and they end up winning that football game, right? It, it Kansas played a heck of a game, but it's not like Kansas came in there and just whooped them, right? It's not like that's what happened. There were very much just, you know, a couple of things that if BYU makes a couple different decisions, a couple different play calls towards the end of the game, uh, they end up winning this football game. And, and you know, 
they're continuing their magic run. I think that they're the better team. I think that they'll bounce back. And honestly, Mitch, to your point, the, the bubble of invincibility being gone, I think puts the extra stakes up there. I think it puts extra pressure on them. And I think it's going to kind of force them to do um, do a little bit more to kind of overcome that and say, hey, we need to really lock in, really focus. Uh, because if we don't, then, yeah, the season could come crashing down. Uh, and and I, I clearly don't think that that's going to be the case with BYU. I think they're a very talented team. I think they're very good, and I think that they can handle that, no problem. Well, both teams do control their destiny here to get to Arlington. Uh, obviously, the Big 12, somebody's got to win the conference, right? Whether it's BYU, Arizona State, Colorado at this point. Um, Trey, it, Kansas State's out. Iowa State needs help. Is that correct? I think that's correct. Yeah, Iowa State needs a lot of help. Okay. Yeah, so for all intents and purposes, we're down to, down to three teams. I, I think, funnily enough, everyone has come around the, to the idea that Colorado – is probably the best overall team remaining. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about Colorado and in, in the Buffs. Um, I, I think later on in the run sheet. Yeah, they, yeah, they, I've got I've got the Big Twelve scenarios down there in the run sheet. The short of it is, Colorado, BYU, and Arizona State all control their own destiny. Yeah, Iowa State needs some help. Perfect. Okay. Well, when we get to the B, uh, the Big Twelve, I'm going to pitch it to Trey. He's got he's got a whole a whole list of chaos that we're rooting for this week. Final Big Three game on our run sheet. Number 19, Army, the troops, uh, taking on number six, Notre Dame. This is a 14 and a half point spread in favor of Notre Dame. It's played at Yankee Stadium, and it's going to be the 6 p.m. game on NBC, Peacock, whichever you choose to view it on. This is going to be fascinating. I think there's so much to pay attention to. We do have the Notre Dame Navy tape, obviously, to refer back to, but Trey, Army and Navy are not not the same football team. Army has been much more put together over the course of the season uh, than Navy was. Notre Dame has been beating the brakes off just about everybody they've played since losing to Northern Illinois. So uh, with that large spread, it feels like maybe the hook is, is coming into play in this one. Which side of that number are you taking? Hook could be absolutely crucial. I'm going to lean on what we saw against Navy for Notre Dame and take Notre Dame to cover in this one. But I'll also say at the same time that that game really got away from Navy and it wasn't so much what Notre Dame was doing. Obviously Notre Dame made a lot of plays on the defensive side of the ball, but Navy had what, like six turnovers in that game. And it really got out of hand quickly to the point where their offense just didn't work. It's not an offense built to come back from that much of a deficit. Obviously army's defense is much more formidable the Navy's as well. I think this is going to be one of the best tests Notre Dame faces all year, probably the toughest team they've played since they played Texas A&M in week one. So I'm, I, I think if Notre Dame wins here, and especially if they cover, it is a quality win and a quality cover for the Fighting Irish. This is a conference championship caliber team in Army. Guys, I just really want to see what happens if Army wins. Because I, if you're rooting for chaos, if you're just rooting for ultimate just destruction of everything we hold dear, Army wins this game. It could cause a lot of ripple effects. We talked about that last night on the live show. But it could cause a lot mm -hmm. of ripple effects, not just for Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame would be out. I think the Big 12 would be sitting there sweating bullets on Selection Sunday to see if they actually get a team in if Army wins this game. That That is a fascinating discussion right i mean you're you're assuming with that that boise state gets in uh where they are ranked right now and they would get that that first well buy, they're which, ahead of all the big 12 teams right they now, are boise they state. are byu right now is slotted in as that 12 seed in boise state if it all ended today would get that buy so yeah fascinating discussion there i i think there's too much money in the big 12 and in these big media rights deals for the committee to allow that to happen and that Have honestly you seen goes the defense budget mitch because it, it, if you want to talk about money <laughs> it, it on <laughs> it goes back to what i was saying in that article i wrote over the weekend that you know without a clear standard there there is room for some fuzzy things to be happening on the periphery with all this money that's exchanging hands i mean heck we've got sitting athletic directors who are very much invested in what happens in the outcome for their teams and their conferences Anyway, whole whole nother soapbox. We'll address that more in the offseason. I'm going to roll with Notre Dame, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying I think that might be the best possible thing for Army. I have been dreadful against the spread this year, guys. And so basically, if I pick against your team, go ahead, 
take it to the bank, lock it up the other way. I would love for Army to win this game because of all the chaos that would then ensue. Remember, Army's already locked into the American Championship game. Them and Tulane will meet in that conference championship game, hopefully with a playoff spot on the line. Now, that starts to get a lot more freed up if you're able to go in and end the, the Fighting Irish this season because make no no mistake here, if Notre Dame loses this game, they're out. You cannot have a loss to Northern Illinois plus another loss. I mean, no, Northern Illinois, I don't even think it's going to a bowl game. They've they've completely self-destructed. Um, you can't have those two losses on your schedule. I think it's part of the reason why Notre Dame is beefing up their schedule in 20, uh, I guess it's 26, 27. They've scheduled some games now in 29 and 30, I believe. I think they just added Texas to the schedule in a couple of future years. Notre Dame realizes that if they're not going to join a conference, if they're not going to have that protection that a conglomerate gives them, then if they're going to have multiple losses on the schedule, they'd better be able to defend them. It cannot be a bunch of buy games. Um, and, you know, when they scheduled Army, we didn't, we didn't know that Army was going to be this this good of an opponent, right? So, uh, you know, kudos to the uh, to the troops for for getting that done and, and being in position where this game matters a whole heck of a lot more than what we thought going into it. Notre Dame, I'll, uh, I'll end with this. Notre Dame's plus fifteen in the turnover margin. Now, six of them came at the hands of the the Navy midshipmen, so you know, maybe take that stat with a grain of salt. But they're averaging thirty eight points per game, big points plus a propensity to force turnovers and score off of those turnovers is ultimately why my football brain is taking Notre Dame uh, minus the points here. And, and it should. I'm going to go ahead and go with you, Mitch, on this one as well. Um, yeah, Notre Dame hasn't played a close game since the end of September. Um, they haven't been in a real competitive game in a long time. Uh, and, and it's weird because, you know, they're not like a juggernaut. They haven't passed for, unless I'm misreading this, they haven't passed for 300 yards this year. Uh, in any game. So they're not like this massive offensive juggernaut. They're just really, really, really good at all the other stuff. They run the football extremely well. They shut people down on the defensive side. They pass effectively, just not for massive, you know, explosive numbers. This won't be a competitive game either, I don't think. And massive kudos to what Army is doing and what they've been able to build. But it, it's not going to be a close game, I don't think, with Notre Dame. Uh, Army and Navy doing a whole bunch for this, you know, late season strength of schedule for Notre Dame and, you know, making their case, especially needed now that Florida State's just, I mean, dog water and just can't play football. And, you know, they're just like the worst team that exists in, in college football at this point. I, I don't know if there's a worse team than Florida State uh, right now. They're just playing really bad. So, you know, with Florida State falling off, Army and Navy really picking up the slack for Notre Dame strength of schedule. So I'm sure the Irish appreciate them for that. But, yeah, this should be a, a blowout and and they should win pretty comfortably. That is 31 and a half point favorite this week, Florida State. You're talking about there, sir. And who are they playing? It doesn't matter. They're 31 and a half point favorite. Aren't they playing someone Charleston who's also Southern. like one and nine or one and ten? They're or playing something Charleston like that? Southern. That, was, yeah, the oh, F, FCS version of Florida State this year. The, the <laughs> fact, it's Florida State versus FCS Florida State. The, the fact that you can bet on that game and there is a spread is the most damning fact about yep. Florida State season. This, it's, this why they, it's why they've got a phone number on all those billboards also, because if you're betting on that game, you need to call that number. <laughs> you need to call the, the Hope line for sure. Hey, 100th anniversary of the Four Horsemen game as well. Uh, this game's commemorating that, I believe. That happened in 1924. Okay, how about that? Uh, I wonder what the, the players in the game of 1924 would, would think if they could if they could comment on the state of college football right now, They're probably all about the size of most kickers. So yeah. even like the offensive linemen. So I, yeah, I was it's a say, different world. I don't think they could conceptualize of college football the way we have it now where it's like, well, you know, there's like all the forward passing and all that other stuff, but then like the helmets and like, Oh yeah, it's like a new rule. You can like talk to a guy over the radio in his helmet. And uh, that would just be so confusing to so many of them. They're like, you're, you have helmet radios now, but how far away are they play in this game? You have uh, helmets now. <laughs> helmets? I was going to say, yeah. explaining the comp, uh, the concept of NIL to someone who just got out of the trenches in France, I, I think would be certainly worth, worth watching. <laughs> Those are our uh, big three games. Uh, again, a lot going on on this week 13 Saturday edition. So let's move into our Saturday storylines. This is presented 
by Baller Pickleball. And unlike home field, I will tell you to use our code 3 Pod for 10% off your entire order at Baller Pickleball. Let's start in the SEC where we've talked about the uh, group of teams in the middle of these rankings right now. Uh, according to the College Football Playoff Committee, you would have every SEC team that makes the playoff on the road Sands Texas, who came in as their you know presumed SEC champ. And Trey, you in the run sheet wrote that the theme this week is just win to stay alive, especially on the road. You have Ole Miss on the road at Florida, Alabama on the road at Oklahoma, Texas A&M on the road against Auburn, looking ahead, hopefully not, to their game against Texas. Meanwhile, the Longhorns uh, are at home as they take on Kentucky. Of those three teams on the road, which of those three in your mind is most likely to have their season ruined this weekend? It's got to be A&M, doesn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, mm -hmm. you just look at the think point so. spreads. Vegas certainly thinks it's A&M. I don't know if it's going to be an Auburn, Alabama, but there's going to be some tomfoolery in the SEC this mm. week. I, I just have the feeling all three of those teams, you mentioned A&M is looking ahead to Texas next week, potentially. And obviously Mike Elko didn't help that by him misspeaking in the press conference this week, but there's going to be some egg bowl temptation to look ahead. There's going to be some iron bowl temptation to look ahead. I don't care how bad Auburn and Mississippi state are this year. Those are big in-state rivalry games. And Oklahoma and uh, Ole Miss playing Florida, on the surface, you know, if those were ranked teams that they're going into, it's a little bit easier to kick your in-state rival down the road another week. But th that that game, it's going to be really hard for all three of those teams to be focused and locked in, regardless of their playoff hopes being on the line. But back to your question, it's got to be Texas A&M. I am a nervous wreck about this game. I did not mm -hmm. enter Sunday as a nervous wreck. And then that line came out, man. And I was just like seeing, seeing all the flashbacks of South Carolina a few weeks ago. So I'm officially a nervous wreck. I hope that the defense can lock down the Auburn run game. I don't think Peyton Thorne can beat you with his arm. So if you can lock down the run game and tackle, I think you're going to be pretty successful, but We've seen them struggle with that over the last few weeks. So I, I'm official in pucker mode. Yeah, I, I think without a doubt, the key to success in Texas A&M and Auburn is tackle, right? You stop the run, you take away what the opposing team really wants to do on offense. I mean, Auburn's numbers, uh, Train, you actually pointed this out. Auburn's numbers offensively are, are actually not all that bad. The glaring weakness is that they're minus 11 in the turnover margin this year. They that's 128th in the country and unfortunately for War Eagle it hasn't mattered if they're on the road or at home. They turn the ball over like it's going out of style. And so I think that without a doubt is the biggest thing that that Hugh Freeze and company have to overcome and it, it's felt like at the absolute worst times too. Uh, they've found a way to cough up the football whether it be a fumble or a Peyton Thorn interception. Conversely, though, for Texas A&M, they don't force a ton of turnovers this year. They've been very timely in the ones that they have forced. But the issue that bit them both at Notre Dame and South Carolina was the big gashing run plays. And Notre Dame is obviously a much more low scoring game. South Carolina kind of ran away with that contest late. But it was the big run plays set up by a missed tackle or two at the line of scrimmage. Without a doubt for me, that's what A&M has to get cleaned up and you heard their players talking about getting the speed getting used to the speed once again after that bye week a and m is built to stifle you on defense and we've seen that at times this season but if they can't tackle jarquez hunter uh, it's going to be potentially a very long painful afternoon evening on the plains uh, i think the only real place where i'll push back on some of that is the problem for the Aggies really has been when it's the quarterback who's a threat to run as well. Because if you're having to second guess yourself, you know, having to kind of maintain that backside, make sure that the quarterback can't escape, hmm. that's been where Andams got burned. And it's, you know, being late to their gap assignments and then the running back gashes you because you were second guessing yourself. It's that kind of a thing that's been the problem for the Aggies. You know, it was a problem when Riley Leonard was doing it at the beginning, and it was definitely a problem with Lenora Sellers where you've seen the Aggies have success, even against teams who have been able to run the football and have had success running the football, 
you've seen the Aggies have success against the teams like Missouri and LSU on the schedule where the quarterback is not a threat to run. So you can just kind of find the running back, figure out where your leverage needs to be, figure out where you need to go, and you can fill those gaps and play downhill. Mm. You know, LSU had been running the football really good coming into the AM game and then just, I mean, ran for what, like 20 something yards? Like it was nothing. Yeah. And th- this, again, like Missouri had been running the football well going into that game. They didn't run very well either. Uh, I just, I don't think that this is the matchup problem for Texas AM. I also don't think it'll be the problem next week against Texas. Obviously, a much better quality team in Texas, but it's also not the matchup nightmare that it would be. You know, as if it was, you know, I, I think AM would much rather play Texas than maybe Alabama just based on the type of quarterback that beats AM this year. And so I, I think when you look at that, I'm not necessarily as worried about the Aggies in this one. Um, I, I think that they'll be able to get pressure on Thorne. I think that they'll be able to force him to make mistakes. I wouldn't be shocked if he throws two, maybe even three interceptions in this game and just based on pressure alone and not seeing things and being able to kind of confuse him set up some short fields, you know, let Marcel Reed kind of go to work. I think the Aggies are going to have a good day in this one. I was going to kind of go the other direction from you guys in terms of what teams need to really look out in the SEC. Ole Miss needs to be careful because Florida's playing a lot better with DJ Lagway at the helm. And, you know, I know that people are going to go back and say, didn't they just get blown out by Texas a couple weeks ago? DJ Lagway wasn't playing in that game. He was hurting that game. He wasn't able to play. All of a sudden he goes last week and uh, all of a sudden it looks a lot better. So, if DJ Lagway can keep things going, if he can kind of keep on the up and up, and, and again, this is a what 18-year-old kid, like he's still progressing, he's still got growth. Week to week, you're gonna see leaps and bounds better. This is a Florida team that's playing with some belief and playing with some mojo. And, and I think that they've they kind of get to play with house money in their own house with Ole Miss coming in. And we've seen Ole Miss flop. Like Ole Miss has flopped in a couple of games. They've looked fantastic in certain games. But are you really telling me that you can believe that, you know, they're, they're going to go like go in there and, you know, they're all going to be super focused and laser tight and everything is going to be normal against the Florida team that really wants to go in there and make some noise, make a big statement at the end of the year. I just I don't buy it. I don't think that Ole Miss loses this game, but I think this is one we'll be watching to the very end. And we'll we'll kind of be one of those, you know, late in the fourth quarter. We were like on the edge of our seats waiting to see if Florida can make that one more play to make it happen. When Ole Miss has struggled this year, it's been giving up the pass, right? Florida's not going to run the ball tremendously well. Uh, That's what Ole Miss has to take away. That's what they want to take away. Now, their defensive line is elite. So the pass rush, the the pressures, the sacks, all a very real concern for Florida. But I agree. I like the arm of DJ Lagway. I think Florida can keep this a game. So I would take Florida to to cover as well. I've got Alabama beating Oklahoma going away. Yeah, they'll I'm beat not, the brakes off Oklahoma. The Sooners aren't very good. Sooners aren't going to a bowl game this year, I don't think. Nope. Um, Kentucky at number three, Texas, is interesting because of the spread. I, as much as I don't necessarily know if Texas's offense is going to just blitzkrieg Kentucky's defense – the Wildcats can't score. They're barely averaging 21 points a game. They're going against the top-ranked total defense and scoring defense in the country in the Texas Longhorns. They're having to do it on the road. They don't have a clear quarterback. I would stay away from the line in this game, but I do feel like Texas wins this one comfortably. I'm more inclined to say that they win it laying the number than Kentucky covering. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Texas has been a different animal at home this year as well. Uh, the Georgia game notwithstanding, uh, they have been really good at home. You saw what they did against the inferior Florida team a couple weeks ago with a third-string quarterback. I think you can expect something somewhat similar this week. Yeah, yeah I, I'd be kind of surprised if Kentucky scores 10 points in this game. I just don't think they're going to do anything on offense in this game. Uh, you know, The only way that they score 10 is if Texas is up like you know 40 or 50 and three in the fourth and they just kind of put in the backups and it's a bunch That's of garbage time against points. Florida. Yeah. 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 Stuff like that. Uh, last, last thing I'll mention the sec Vanderbilt seven and a half point dogs on the road. Guys, what am I missing here? LSU can't defend a mobile quarterback. <laughs> Vandy's offense is even less makes even less sense than just a traditional read option offense. I, I'm taking the doors plus the points. I'd take them out. Right. Wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, the Magic's worn off Vanderbilt just a little bit in the sure. last couple of weeks, but the Magic has certainly worn off of LSU. And if you look at just the vibes in that program, who's going to be more happy to play this game? Going to take a little bit of a bowl game mindset here. Who's more happy to be at this game? Mm. 
certainly the Vanderbilt Commodores. I'll take them to cover. Yeah, I look, that LSU locker room stinks right now. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark and, and especially in the state of Baton Rouge. I, I don't know what's happening. Everything is bad, and and I wouldn't want to be in there. Brian Kelly blaming his players for everything, can't take accountability. It's not good at LSU right now, and and I'm not going to take that kind of culture in a dogfight possibly with Vanderbilt. No, I'm not taking that. Certainly feels like one program on the rise, one maybe on the decline, and boy, before the season, that is not the order I would have I would have put those two teams in. <laughs> Let's go to the Big 12. We talked about BYU and Arizona State in a destiny game. Colorado, though, on the road at Kansas, they're only two and a half point favorites as they head to Arrowhead. Kansas seems to be figuring something out, but so too are the Buffs. Which side of this are you taking? Can Colorado focus, control their destiny, get to Arlington? Or is Kansas going to play spoiler once again? I think Colorado is going to cover this spread. It's been really fun watching Kansas knock out a couple of big, uh, big time teams the last couple of weeks, but Colorado just continues to impress me with how much their defense has improved this year. They've mm-hmm. given up points and spots, but really it's it's been a night and day transformation from what we saw last year. I think Kansas has been a really fun story down the stretch, how they've kind of figured it out and fought for a bowl game, but I think that bid ends this week. I think Colorado covers and maybe wins going away. I'm going to go with the unconventional logic here, and I'm not really going to make a whole lot of a football point. Uh, Kansas has just kind of been like, uh, again, they've been hot. They've been winning. Things have been going their way. They didn't necessarily do anything really to win against BYU. We talked about that earlier. They just kind of made a couple plays and snuck by, but that ain't nothing. Uh, And and I also just want to point out that bad things tend to happen in threes. So I'm going to go ahead and say that, you know, this is going to be the three Pete for Kansas of just ruining the big 12 season. I, I think Kansas is over here to just, spoil the fun for the entire conference and and just do that i think there's, there's a lot of guys playing for pride a lot of guys playing for again like a bowl game and just a lot of people doing that i don't think that they're the better team colorado should win this game but i, I just think something wonky is going to happen at arrowhead and i think kansas will find a way to to make it three in a row i'll say kansas's luck runs out this week i'll take the buffs Minus the points. Um, elsewhere, Iowa State, they need a whole lot of help here. They go on the road at Utah. It's funny, earlier in the preseason, we we kind of picked this as, okay, maybe that's the game that Iowa State drops, and that's what kind of keeps things interesting if they are at the top of the Big 12 Conference. We were really having a hard time seeing them going on the road and losing to Utah. I- Iowa State has not been impressive. They've completely fallen apart, and and yet I'm still kind of wondering – uh, can Utah win this game at home? Maybe, maybe they can. Uh, this is a game I would absolutely stay away from with my hard-earned American currency. I just don't know what you're betting on if you're betting on Utah because you're hoping that Iowa State doesn't show up. They kind of came back and looked a lot better last week against a competent Cincinnati team. So, yeah, I mean – the Tech game was in a driving rainstorm. The Kansas game is what it is. It was Kansas exploding, and Iowa State not being able to stop it. Utah, I would be more inclined to be excited about betting on them if they had shown me anything on the ground because that's where you can get Iowa State. But mm-hmm. when there's just no threat to pass, even Iowa State, a team that's really struggled with stopping the run, I think will be able to stop the run. The reason the – Colorado game last week was even as close as it was for Utah is because of all the turnovers. I think there were three yep. turnovers for the Buffs. So, yeah, I'm going to take Iowa State going away here and just putting Utah's sad season to bed. Now, you have a doomsday scenario that, that you've I outlined. I, I would just love if you would walk the listeners through that. Yeah, so a couple of things here. If you're an Iowa State fan, who you need to root for, you need to win out and kind of hope. So it's a weird scenario. So – Iowa State would win a head-to-head tiebreaker against Arizona State or BYU. So they need to hope that one of those two teams loses next week. Arizona has the Territorial Cup against – Arizona State has the Territorial Cup against Arizona, I should say. BYU hosts Houston. So you need to hope that one of those – whoever loses the – Whoever loses this week wins. Mm -hmm. And then whoever wins this week loses next week if you're Iowa State. Now – If you're a pure sicko and just want to watch the world burn, I'm going to run through this extremely quickly. Just listen up. 
Arizona State over BYU, Baylor over Houston, Kansas over Colorado, Kansas State over Cincinnati, Texas Tech over Oklahoma State, TCU over Arizona, Iowa State over Utah, UCF over West Virginia. Next week, UCF over Utah, Oklahoma State over Colorado, Arizona over Arizona State, Baylor over Kansas, BYU, uh, Houston over BYU, TCU over Cincinnati, Kansas State over Iowa State, and Texas Tech over West Virginia. For those of you doing math at home, that would create an eight-way tie at six and three for first in the Big 12. And your Big 12 championship would be, drum roll please, Baylor versus Texas Tech. So, <laughs> Heck yeah. You are still alive in the it. college football playoff if you are a Baylor Bear or a Texas Tech fan. You see all have... those things that I just listed to happen. And if you're going to root for it, you might as well put it on a parlay. I'm sure you can get some fantastic odds at that. Trey, sure. are you telling me that we have an actual chance, maybe slim, but an actual chance to have a butt bowl Big 12 championship game? We have a chance. We have a Come very up. fraction of a percentage of a point chance. That's that's what college football is always always about. I'm going to have you tweet that out, by the way. Make make a note. Make a thread of that. Yeah, uh, if you couldn't slow me, slow me down enough to listen to that, then I, I will put it out on Twitter. That is that is America's... We'll show our work. That is America's parlay right there. Um we're rooting for it in the Big 12. Let's go to the ACC. We talked about them probably being a one-bid league at this point. Wake is at number eight Miami this week. It felt like Miami, as high up as they are, and I think there's certainly a case for them to be further down than eight, it feels like the committee is uh, certainly making a case for Miami being on thin ice. Um, and Trey, we'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining the show. Trey's going to go watch a little... SEC basketball feels like Miami season is, is on some thin ice right now, 24 point favorites. They seemingly have to not only win out, but then win in the ACC championship. The other favorite to get there, the leader in the ACC is number 13 SMU nine and a half point favorites on the road at Virginia. Is there something that you're watching for Garrett in, in these two games? Um, I, I don't know if there's necessarily something I'm watching, but I think really at this point, what we're looking for is we're going to see which of these two teams wins the conference and they're just going to flip flop. I think the committee clearly has said like, this is where we want these teams to be. Yep. One of these teams is going to get the first round by almost by default. The other team is going to be a couple spots out of the playoff, right? This is just kind of what I think the committee has shown outside of maybe both teams, just blitzkrieging the rest of the schedule and just winning all these games, 66 to three from here on out. I just don't see a way for either of these teams to really make the case they both belong in um, outside again, outside of some chaos scenario where a bunch mm -hmm. of teams drop. But um, yeah, I don't think there's a whole lot that I'm watching for here. SMU has got to be a little bit careful with Virginia on the road, but I'm not really worried about them taking care of their business. Um, yeah. I, I think both teams will probably win out and we'll just see what happens at the end of the season for them. It is a little bit of a tricky spot. The, the who's have to win either this week or next against Virginia tech in order to secure bowl eligibility, which uh, I'm, I'm thrilled for Tony Elliott. The wins have finally started to come. They were one of the teams I highlighted this preseason as, hey, take the over on this and let's root for bowl eligibility. We we might be there. Two tough games, but the upset win over Pitt a couple of weeks ago makes it possible once again. Uh, over in the Big Ten, Oregon has already clinched a spot in the Big Ten Championship. We talked about Indiana with a, a Hoosier win, it would be Oregon and Indiana. It would be set. Um, if not, though, Penn State still technically has a chance. They need Ohio State to win this week and then lose to Michigan um, to get into the championship week. Maybe the funniest thing that came out of the Big Ten this week, Garrett, was that the conference itself had to run so many scenarios and double-check themselves. I think they had 16 possible scenarios that they were mathematically working through. They didn't announce that Oregon had clinched a spot in the Big Ten Championship until Tuesday. I mean, how could you know, right? There's just so many scenarios. You've got a bunch of teams. It's a little top-heavy. Hmm. Yeah, how could you possibly know? It just took that long for the supercomputers to run the numbers or something. I don't know. It's This is the new era of college football we find ourselves in, where the tiebreakers go down to the seventh level, and you got to find not just like win percentage or opponent win percentage or win percentage on the road or win percentage when it's noon or win. Per I, like there's all these different weird tiebreakers all the way up and down the list. Uh, yeah, it just takes a little while to confirm that stuff. But congrats to Oregon. Obviously, they've had a fantastic season and they, you know, obviously the big marquee win against Ohio State. Um, it, it's a big deal and they absolutely deserve it. 
And at this point, you know, again, watching some of those tiebreaker scenarios, I don't really think Penn State's going to make it. It's going to be a, a de facto, I think, playoff game this week for Indiana and, and Ohio State. I, I really don't see a way that Ohio State drops to Michigan outside of they just have been dropping to Michigan the last several years. It's a very different game this year. It's two very different teams this year. Yeah, I agree. Penn State, uh, 12 and a half point favorites on the road at Minnesota. That's a fascinating spot for a Minnesota team who is certainly playing better football down the stretch. Number 25, Illinois. They're back up into the rankings. They're only a one point favorite at Rutgers, which I find absolutely fascinating. Vegas thinks this is a trap game for the Illini, but the, the two storylines here for Illinois, a surprise nine and three campaign could be awaiting them. They, they would play uh, Northwestern, I believe, next week. And so that very much starts to feel like a nine win campaign for Rutgers. They had a great start to the season, but now uh, after a couple of really bad losses, they get waxed by Wisconsin a couple weeks ago. I think they're fighting more to prove that the beginning of the season wasn't necessarily a fluke and all that recruiting success could stick that the program's headed in the right direction. Yeah, Rutgers really needs this to, again, not just, I don't think the season's completely gone off the rails, but they need to prove that it's still on track and that everything's still going the right direction. So Rutgers needs this. They're at home. I like the spot. Uh, I might even pick Rutgers to win that one, but it, if I'm being honest, I can't get too passionate about that game right now. The, neither team's really impressed me down the stretch. I know Illinois, is, they found their way to be ranked, right? Illinois has played very well. But I, they just haven't. They haven't really impressed me. They've been beating a lot of teams. I feel like they should be beating. Um, you know, the, I was impressed with the Nebraska win until Nebraska turned out to be pretty bad. So that, that's maybe a little bit tarnished in hindsight as well. But uh, yeah, I think I think I'd probably lean Rutgers in that one if I really had to pick it. But uh, I, I wouldn't probably go anywhere with my money on this one. Uh, I think Illinois, with another year of Luke Altmyer on deck for next season. He really took care of the interception issues that he mm -hmm. he suffered in 2023. So, man, I think stock up on uh, on the it Illini. Could just be a year away. Could could potentially be. Boy, Wisconsin at Nebraska. Nebraska's two and a half point favorites. And I tell you what, if the Huskers lose this, I don't know how much more heartbreak that they can take. Nebraska is 0 and 8 in their last two seasons after getting their fifth win. We we know about the debacle and the train wreck. Last season, the heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak mm -hmm. after they got to five wins. This year, there is a chance that we do the exact same thing. They lose to USC last week by one score. They lost to UCLA at home the week before that. Mm -hmm. And now they've, they've got Wisconsin and Iowa to finish it out. For Wisconsin, they just fired Phil Longo. They don't feel good about what they have at quarterback with Braden Locke. I'm I'm leaning towards the streak being over. I think Nebraska gets it done this week. I think so too. But the one thing that I'm going to say that I'm going to pause on and saying, oh yeah, Nebraska should just find a way. When that pressure is on you, mm. it's just a different beast, right? Sure. You, you you can feel that in the locker room. You can understand what the pressure is. You can understand the stakes. They're looking ahead to next week, realizing their best chance at getting a bowl game is not next week. It is this week. So we yeah. got to get it now or it may not happen. Yeah, I think a lot of Nebraska fans and a lot of Nebraska's team is going to be sitting on, you know, pins and needles and waiting and just saying, OK, well, we, we got to find a way to get it done this week. I yep. think that they do. I think that they do. But this is not an easy spot by any means. And, and this is also one that because it's at home, it's going to feed off the crowd energy, which you typically say is a good thing. But when the crowd is nervous and when the mm. crowd can feel it slipping away, you know, some booze could come cascading down. Some of the, the anger and the frustration could come cascading down. You really don't want to get this thing into a death spiral if you're Nebraska. Well, we talked about that with Georgia and Alabama at the beginning of the year, right? Mm -hmm. Georgia had gotten out to a quick start. We thought maybe all of a sudden the, the home crowd, the home faithful, maybe start to work against you. I, I agree. That's a real thing. Yep. Uh, finally, USC and UCLA are fighting for bowl eligibility. U, uh, USC is four and a half point favorites on the road. USC needs to win this one or Notre Dame to get to a bowl game, so they need to win this one. UCLA must win this one and next week in a weird season finale against Fresno State in order to get to bowl eligibility. Um, I tend to think that maybe USC gets it done, but I'm going to take UCLA just for the 
just for the memes at this point. I'm going to pick UCLA to win this one. They've been playing a little better. They're, they're playing a little bit hotter. I know that they lost to Washington last week. I get that. But before that, they had rattled off three straight, including a win against Iowa and at Nebraska, like you just mentioned. So this is a UCLA team that's playing a little bit better. I, I think what probably happened is this coaching staff just was not ready to be, uh, you know, where they were. The, obviously, the coach, Foster, he, he was not – a coordinator even at any point until he got to this stage. So like he, he was not, I don't think prepared to be a head coach, mm. but what a job adjusting on the fly. And I mentioned in the off season, UCLA this year has traveled more than 26 NFL teams will this season. So that's, wild. that's a lot of travel for a team like this. It's a problem with the college football and regionality and everything else. That's an off season topic, but for a first time head coach, first time, even coordinator, to adjust like that on the fly after your roster has been rated and to find yourself in a position where, yeah, these last two weeks, if you can take care of USC and then go beat Fresno State, you're going to be in a bowl game. Hmm. That's a heck of a coaching job, and he should feel really proud of that. It, it would be a step in the right direction for mm -hmm. UCLA, no doubt about it. Uh, let's wrap up the show here with the little G5 talk, and I've got the MAC and Conference USA on my TV this weekend. The MAC, easy, Tuesday, Wednesday games right now. You've got Ohio and Toledo playing in the Glass Bowl right now. So uh, as you're listening to this podcast, definitely make sure you go back and check that score. It's tied 0-0. They're well into the second quarter right now. It's been a defensive struggle. Tim Albin, we've talked about it, has done miracle work up there in Athens. Could continue with a win over Toledo. They're in first place in the max standings right now. I don't know if a, if uh, with a win they would clinch a spot in the MAC title. I, I think they would, but don't quote me on that. Uh, Miami of Ohio kept their title hopes alive by beating NIU. They eliminated the Huskies from Matt contention last night. So right now it feels like the winner of this game and Miami of Ohio will meet in Detroit, but don't count out Bowling Green. They're still right there as well. They should beat Ball State on Saturday in their first game without Mike New. Conference USA, Garrett, they're essentially in a two-week playoff. Uh, you've got four teams at the top of the standings. You've got Sam Houston State, Jacksonville State, Western Kentucky and Liberty. Jacksonville State is 6-0 and in conference there in the driver's seat. You've got the Bearcats and the Gamecocks that play each other this week. And you've got Western Kentucky and Liberty that play this week. Then you flip them next week. Sam and Liberty will play. And then you have Jacksonville State and Western Kentucky play. So essentially, you've got the playoff before the conference championship game, which is a majestic way for this conference to come down to. And for a conference that will not factor into the college football playoff, this is exciting. This is really fun to just say, hey, we're not worried about the big time implications. We're just worried about the conference. That's fun. That's a good time. And I think it's cool. I think it's it's going to be fun for all the fans of the schools. I know that I'd like to find my way out to go watch Sam at some point over the next you know couple of weeks. And you know, I know we'll be down in that area that night. So you know, possibly a chance to go sneak our way over to a Sam game. But yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Um, it'll be a fun way to come down to the wire. I don't know who comes out on top of this right now. You might be tempted to say Liberty, but I mean, at this point, I'm I'm not convinced any of these teams are necessarily head and shoulders over the rest of them. Well, so Liberty needs the most help. They're the only team in this quartet that's four and two. Right. Um, Sam Houston, uh, man, it's been a rags to riches story, which has been amazing this year. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna lean Jacksonville State. I think they punch a ticket to the conference championship this week. And then Western Kentucky had looked very solid in. Conference USA play, but they stubbed their toe against Louisiana Tech in a weird 12 to 7 game. I think they end Liberty season. And then next week, uh, you know, in, in that case, Sam and Liberty probably aren't playing for something. Um, Western, well, I guess if Western Kentucky lost and Sam won, then Sam would would get into the conference championship game. But it's gonna be fascinating to watch this conference USA, like I said, quartet coming down the last two weeks. As you mentioned, if you're not gonna factor into the playoff narrative at large, this is the best, the next best thing. Yep. And it'll be for, you know, bowl seating and stuff like that. So it's not like there's no consequences, sure. but it, it, it'll just kind of be fun to see how this shakes out. And I'm also curious to see from this conference, how they do shape up in bowl season, like which of these teams are going to get matched up with like a lower level or like a mid-level Mac or like a, a mid-level Sunbelt or, you know, kind of figure out where those teams slot in, how they can go compete against some of these other conferences. Mm-hmm. Well, that'll do it for our week 13 preview. I say we wrap it right there. Let us know um, 
where you're leaning this week as far as your big three matchups. Who do you like as far as playoff seeding goes? Uh, if you hadn't already commented on Train Garrett's live show from Tuesday night, definitely go check that out. Leave us a comment what you would have your order be. Who's on upset alert this week? Who do you have, as I mentioned earlier, having their season ruined, whether it's on the road, maybe it's a sneaky game at home. Definitely let us know if you're new to the show, you're a new Jimmy and Joe, definitely subscribe on all the, the channels, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. We're glad to have you here. And uh, we are excited to go into rivalry week next week as well. We've got a live show coming at you Saturday night to wrap up week 13. So we hope to see you there. For Trey Reeves, Garrett Turney, I'm Mitch Mason. Thanks for hanging out with us. Until next time, so long, everybody. Gracious. Yep. Hey.